talk of the day, as you can see, is Steve and Nina here from Fulbright talking about level design in Tacoma. Hello, I'm Nina Freeman, um, and I'm here with Steve Gaynor to talk about designing for nonlinear story discovery in Tacoma, which is a game that we worked on and released uh, this past year. Um, so I, I am a level designer at Fulbright, and obviously I worked on Tacoma. Tacoma, for those of you who haven't played it, here's a screenshot of it. Um, it's a first-person 3D exploration game set on a space station in the near future. It's about a woman named Amy who's been sent to retrieve an AI um, from a space station called Tacoma that has been recently evacuated for a reason that you as the player are not fully aware of in the beginning of the game. Um, and you play as Amy and sort of discover what happened with this crew that left and why the AI is still there and all this stuff. So the game is really about exploring the station to learn about what happened there recently. Um, and the story is communicated on multiple levels throughout the game, both mechanically and through the environment, um, which is what sort of this whole topic is, because um, it's all sort of relating back to level design for us. Um, so we'll explain what some of our design goals were, uh, how they relate to level design specifically, and what it was like actually implementing them throughout the development of Tacoma from the beginning to the end, basically. Um, so I'll pass the torch along to Steve, who will kick off our little discussion. Peace. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. Um, <clears throat> let me see, can I angle that a little bit? No, I can't. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I was the um, co-story lead and kind of the you know, creative direction uh, force of the, of the game. And uh, I come from a level design background. So you know, like Nina was saying, um, Fulbright, Fulbright in the level design summit is a piece of level design jargon. <laughs> so like the name of our studio is a level design term. So we have a very like level design centric kind of founder's syndrome about how we tell stories and, and what the focus of our design process is and how we relate to the player. Um, so on my side of the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the kind of top-down direction and player experiential intent behind the game, how we got to that from Gone Home and what we were trying to do with Tacoma and how we worked together um, to, to put that on screen. Um, so yeah, the, our, our first game um, at Fulbright was Gone Home, which there's a screenshot of up here, um, which was a game about exploring an empty house, uh, well, empty of people uh, house uh, to find out about what happened um, to the people who, who lived there. Um, it was a you know, story exploration game, a, uh, a walking simulator uh, of, <laughs> of, of early vintage. Um, and, and it really uh, focused on just the environment, the objects in it, and what you could learn from that and finding you know, audio diaries um, that explain the story within that. Um, but going from Gone Home to Tacoma, we wanted to expand on what we do with these kinds of games mechanically um, and work more on how the player is involved with the moments in the story and how they engage with finding the story actively in a way that we didn't in Gone Home. Um, we wanted to bring pl the player closer to moments in the story kind of as they happened while also allowing them to have the full freedom to find every detail they're interested in like they had in Gone Home. Um, so as part of that, we were really heavily inspired by um, immersive theater productions like Sleep No More, uh, where the audience shares the space with the performers and follows them through the, the, the performance space and kind of chooses their own path through these scenes that are, that are happening. Um, something that is, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Sleep No More. It's a, it's a performance that's been in production for like, I don't know, like six, seven years now in, um, in New York. And uh, it takes place across three floors of a converted hotel. I think it's actually a converted warehouse that they made look like a hotel. But um, basically, you as an audience member in this space, and there's a lot of performers that are moving through it along their own paths, and you as an individual can only follow one you know, you can only be in one place at one time. So the, the performance is an hour long, but it loops three times um, over the, the course of the night. And so you as an individual can say like, oh, I followed 
these performers into this scene and then followed that guy last time, I'm going to follow the lady that was the other side of it this time and see more of the total, but you're kind of building up partial information about what the entire performance is through where, what you choose to observe. Um, we wanted to take that core experience, which we felt is really um, unique and, and valuable, um, and convert it into a form that felt native to a digital um, uh, experience. Um, and so for, for us, what that meant was that since this is a digital uh, game, instead of it just looping and you choosing what you're gonna do on the next loop, we could give you the ability to fast forward and rewind and pause and be in control of both the performance and your experience of it instead of just your experience of the performance. Um, so we wanted to give players the tools to understand the story as it happens by actually being able to have hooks into it um, and, and what they are seeing of it and what it's doing, along with being observant. Um, basically to be a more active observer than we had um, in, in our prior games. Um, but you know, we, we didn't start from this as our set of core mechanics um, when we started working on uh, Tacoma. When we started, we, we had um, a much more traditional uh, progression style. Um, you know, we wanted, we, we started with a story and progression structure that was very close to, to Gone Home. You know, here we have, you know, the first thing you do in Gone Home is move an object and find a key and unlock a door with it, which is like extremely traditional. And we do have some locked doors and stuff in Tacoma, but it was more at the center of what we were doing in our, our first rev of the game. Um, you know, the, this, this progression style is derived from classic audio diary based level design, um, you know, which, so I, I worked on the, um, multiple people at the, at the studio worked on the Bioshock series um, before we, we worked at Fulbright. And I kind of learned how to tell a story in a level from those games. Um, and, you know, I was very familiar with how you stage out spaces to place story breadcrumbs to have the player kind of move through a story as they move through a space. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I was probably too familiar with it because we said, we should do that again. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, like, that's fair, right? Like, I don't, I don't know, like, you, it, it is a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate way to, to make a thing. But as we started to, to do it, um, you know, we, we kind of realized that it wasn't speaking fully to what we actually wanted to do with the game. Um, you know, in a, in a mostly linear story game, you use audio diaries, um, you know, to, to match the player's flow through the space. In Gone Home, you're discovering this story of a young woman named Sam who's a high schooler and kind of what's happened to her in the year that you've been away. She um, moves to a new house, which is the house you're exploring, goes to a new school, meets a, a, another uh, young lady at the school, and they fall in love. Um, and so, you know, in the game, this is the first part of um, Gone Home. This is the entry and the West Hall of the house. Um, and so, you know, we arrange the plot points in the order that you'll most likely encounter them. Um, and it, you know, it's, it, 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 it can feel nonlinear. It at least is player driven and self guided, but it still is saying we're going to send you on a reliable path through these spaces that tell you a linear story. Um, and you know, in its original state, Tacoma followed this same design approach. The spaces were laid out kind of as a string of pearls, um, and each point in it contained an isolated section of the story or a, a plot point or a, a moment, um, and you moved through them and they were basically spent and then you continued on your way. Um, and our first pass included these AR projections, these 3D recordings that ended up being the core of the, the finished game, but they were much more isolated. They were essentially you know, visual audio diaries. I think that we've seen these a lot in games, um, you know, where you kind of are playing a sci-fi game and you walk into a room and a you know, hologram shows up and you don't really need to look at it usually. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's visual flavor for an audio diary. Um, but as we were doing that, we realized that, yeah, it wasn't really different. It wasn't really, you know, something that we hadn't done before. It was just a sci-fi version of here's your audio diary. Um, and so, you know, with that version of the game, we basically, it, it showed us what we wanted to do with this, you know, element of, of what we were doing because 
it showed us what it wasn't doing. Um, so you know, the fact that these AR characters actually fit in our kind of staid level design um, process showed that they kind of weren't having enough impact on the game because um, they, they didn't force us to design it differently. Um, you know, there were one or two places in the original version of the game where these AR scenes kind of spread out over more space um, and showed us the potential of like, oh, okay, this person leaves the room and you can either stay in the room or follow them and you're kind of doing that, that piecing together. Um, but it still was localized. It was still in, on the scale of just like, you know, kind of a 20 foot radius or, you know, 40 foot radius or something. Um, but it showed us that we could do more with it if we thought about level design differently. Um, you know, our levels needed to be reshaped to embrace nonlinear interconnected AR scenes, which means they needed to be designed for those scenes, not be designed and then we put the scenes into them. Um, you know, they needed to be just larger and more complex, have more going on in them. The scenes needed to be longer, they needed to cover more area, and the kind of area they covered needed to be different. Um, it basically was the thing that forced us out of our traditional, you know, shock game audio diary um, level design uh, uh, territory, uh, which was good, but it also meant that we had a lot of new problems to solve, which is also good, except when you're trying to ship a game, because it's hard, uh, it takes a long time. Um, so, you know, our, our, our AR scenes turned from these points where you would kind of encounter one character or a couple of characters and, and be there to webs. Um, they had multiple characters that all had individual threads that were running parallel to each other and that, like Sleep No More, you couldn't see all of at once. In fact, you can't see all of any of our central AR scenes unless you pause and rewind and move through them a number of times. Uh, Pardon me. And we leave that to the, to the player to determine how deep they want to go into seeing the, the, the content of these scenes. Um, but that was also good because that is in line with what we wanted the player's relationship to Gone Home to be, which is to say, there's a house here, there's a bunch of stuff in it. If you find all the stuff, it's because you wanted to find all the stuff, not because you, know, you felt like you had to or you're checking off a list or, or whatever. And so similarly, you know, at the point that we expanded on what our AR scenes were, it reinforced that central player experience in a totally different form. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> but it took us a while to get there. It took us a first version of the game that we were like, oh, this isn't what we're doing, um, to realize, you know, what that was. Um, so, you know, now when you play Tacoma, um, you see our version of what it means for these AR scenes not to just be visual audio diaries, but to be the central mechanic of the game, the way that you discover the story and what the rest of the game is supporting as opposed to being a supplemental part of the overall experience. Um, so that's our, that, that, was, that was our, um, our direction, right? We, we worked together to discover the mechanics and what the requirements were for that central player experience. Um, but then the question became, you know, how do we actually build those spaces and build the scenes and do the work to support the player through that entire experience in the details, um, not just at the high level. Uh, and so Nina's gonna talk a little bit about that process of putting it on screen. Okay. Wow, nice job, Steve. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I'll be back later. Yeah, I don't clap. We'll clap for you every time. Um, one thing I want to add to what Steve was just saying, which wasn't in my slides, but now I want to say it, is that people, other developers, might find it interesting that in that process of going from more of a string of pearls approach to this like interconnected AR scene approach with the rewinding and fast forwarding that we ended up with, we had a whole full version like of the game that we had built that we just like basically completely threw in the trash, and that was like over like a year of work maybe it was like this we we uh sometimes you you do pre-production on purpose yeah sometimes you realize you were doing it afterwards yeah and exactly <laughs> spent a year on pre-pro without realizing so like this is all a big learning experience for us i feel like and yeah we really did like kind of end up starting largely from scratch when we found the actual mechanics that we felt like inspired by so maybe just a little nugget um <laughs> that people might find interesting okay 
So I'm going to talk about like paper mapping and gray blocking and all that sort of like implementation stuff. So what I knew when I started paper mapping, um, which I think it was like me, Steve, and Tynan. I did a lot of it, though. Um, what I knew was that from this earlier version of Tacoma, the thing that was inspiring us that made us want to change the game so much were the scenes that were taking place in these more open, interconnected spaces where characters in our scenes could walk around from room to room and sort of like pass each other in a natural way. And that, that felt like a pretty good structure for our AR scenes. And I'll get into a little more detail about what that means. Um, but I came into the paper maps knowing that. Um, and I knew a little bit about what the AR scenes that Steve and Carlo were developing. And I knew that each part of the station would serve to house a specific character with a specific job. Um, and thus would need the realistic facilities to support these functions. So with that in mind, I focused on creating non-linear spaces that would support both the future AR scenes and sort of the more utilitarian aspect of like, who are these characters and what are they actually doing there? What do they have to do to realistically fulfill their job in their section of the station? So it's like, we have like our botanist has like his botany wing, sub wing, and then we have like our engineer has like her area. So it was sort of like job based sections of the game that I was paper mapping early on. Uh, so here's some text and not the paper maps because that's the next slide. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, it's because I didn't hit the button correctly. Okay, so to get more into paper mapping, here are some actual paper maps. Um, I want to talk about why I think sort of our, our initial approach worked so well with AR scenes that were eventually um, built with these. Um, and these are two of the early admin paper maps. So the administration wing is like sort of the first big wing that you encounter in the game. Um, and it contains the operations uh, facilities and the um, personnel, uh, the admin and operations facilities, and it's called the personnel wing. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> So the earlier paper map is the one on the left, and then the one on the right is sort of closer to what our final like gray block ended up being and what the final level is now in the game. Um, so while I was paper mapping and working on that one on the left, which is the early one, uh, I'd ask myself how the rooms would be laid out and what order they would be laid out in sort of in the space such that the people who live there could actually use them realistically. So I think this is especially important because Tacoma is about a bunch of characters that are living and working on a space station like in isolation with this small group. So they're like literally living in their workspace. Um, and so how do I design a space that seems like it would actually be tolerable to someone who is in this sort of extreme situation? Um, so one of the obvious questions for this is like, where does the bedroom belong in this kind of space? Where do the personal spaces belong in this like primarily workspace oriented station? And Nina, yeah. can I interject? Yeah, for go a for it. Um, so something that, so, so as far as the, the paper map goes, something that I think is, a couple of things I think are probably interesting are A, so Robert has done uh, a, a blog post <laughs> at, at some point about sort of like the, the, the uh, the stages of, of being a good level designer, basically, and how there's sort of like complexity and interconnectivity of space that you learn over time. Um, and I think that you'll see that the one on the right is a much better version of that than the one on the left. Um, and it, it, it both supports our scenes better because the spaces kind of have overlap the way the scenes do, but it also just naturally makes it feel like a more believable place to be, um, especially on a space station. It's like they want to have a conservation of space. So as far as the fiction driving what we do, we're like, also, we should bring it in so there's not wasted space because mm -hmm. it's, it's up. Um, and the other thing that I think is hopefully, I don't know, it's interesting to me um, is that Nina, um, before she worked at Fulbright, had only made like smaller 2D games. And so this progression is also like, Nina learning to be a 3D level designer as this process was going on. And I think right. kind of Zero. like, it was very interesting to me to see your paper maps evolve as you kind of did a lot of revs of like, I'll paper map it, then I'll gray block it. Oh, I can see why that isn't really what I was going for. I'll paper map it again based on, on that. So some of the progression, I think, of the spaces was also like your 
like learning mm -hmm. process as kind of becoming a, a level designer, which was cool. Yeah, it's hilarious. I was looking through <laughs> like the whole, all my old like notebook of paper maps and I looked at the first one and it was just like a box. <laughs> when, like I divided the box a couple times. <laughs> Gotta was, start somewhere. It was so bad. I didn't put that in any of the slides. Too embarrassing. Uh, but yeah, I did a lot of paper maps and one of the things we did focus on was yeah, like cutting out stuff, like cutting out as many hallways as possible and just like making our spaces as compact as possible to also support the realism and the utilitarianism of these spaces because like you wouldn't, it doesn't make sense to have like such a sprawling space station. Like that wouldn't make sense for the company in the game to build such a huge space for the small amount of people who have kind of, as we explore in the game, like crappy jobs. So it's like sort of a small, very compact space and like the paper map process was super iterative um, so like the time difference between these two paper maps are pretty wide. Like we did a lot of iterative paper mapping, um, especially in the beginning. Um, so like I was talking about the bedrooms. So when we're thinking about like where a bedroom would go in like a workspace on a space station like this, you probably, when you think about it, you probably don't want it near the entrance of a wing because that doesn't feel very private, right? You also don't want to put someone's bunk right next to their office because like who wants to sleep next to their office? Like you probably don't want to do that. Um, and even though this is like a corporation building it, I still don't think they would even do that. That would be really evil. <laughs> we could have gone in that direction. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there was a clear separation between public and private spaces on the station, given the fact that the station was built for long-term postings on it um, for these people. So I iterated on these paper maps with this concept in mind and came to a decision that our levels should have the sort of hub and spoke structure. Um, so for example, admin's hub is the dining room. So you can see it's sort of like that central space where all the other spaces branch off of it. Um, and each space that branches off the central hub is separated to a different degree based on whether it's a workspace or a private space. Um, so most workspaces branch directly from the hub uh, without much space in between since they're meant to feel more easily accessible by multiple members of the crew who might need to use them for work. Um, so the conference room is right next to the dining room. I have it circled right there. Um, and that conference room even has a window looking into the hub because a conference room is like an extra public space where like they're having meetings with many different people on the station. Um, and the conference room is also like, it's also sort of like associated with the dining room because it's like these sort of like public gathering spaces and this wing is really like dedicated to that because it's like administration. This is where people come to meet with their supervisor, Evie, to have meetings with her, to go to the conference room, to eat. Um, and so it kind of makes sense to have these places closer together for us. Um, and then sort of the opposite of that is the private space um, and in this wing, I have circled here where the bunk is for Evie. Uh, Evie St. James, she's the station administrator, so she lives in the administration wing. Um, and her bunk has this sort of nice hallway that's connected to that hub space, but it has this separate hallway unlike the conference room, which literally just has a door and a window separating it from the hub space. Um, so this is like an example of how we're like separating private space more deliberately. Uh, and this kind of approach with the hub and spoke structure and separating private spaces really deliberately works super well for AR scenes because you can have conversations that intersect and break off in a natural way. So for example, you see a lot of conversations in Tacoma intersect in the hub space of a wing where the characters would naturally be passing by each other. So like say there's one part where it's like Evie like comes out from her office and she's walking through and then she ends up in a conversation at the dinner table, because she's like naturally moving from a private space to a public space and encounters a group there and stops to talk to them. Um, and then like with these more public spaces, it like makes sense that they would be gathering there to hang out with each other, right? Um, so the open interconnectedness of these spaces worked super well because of that natural flow of people through them based on how they would be like living their lives naturally. Um, so I have some more examples of this. So we have Sarah right here who's at the pool table in the administration wing talking to Odin who's the station AI. And she talks to Odin a lot and it's great. Uh, and so she's in this open space that the dining room overlooks. So she, you can see sort of like there's an upwards ramp going up and there's the dining room above and then she's below um, with Odin. 
Um, and soon enough, she's like, she's sitting there playing pool, and then Nat actually comes over to the railing, which I have her little yellow arrow pointing to Nat, and she like calls Sarah over for cake, which is happening upstairs. Um, this is kind of a neat moment, because it's like you're, maybe as a player, you're focused on what Sarah's talking about to Odin, and that's, your full attention is focused on that. And then suddenly you hear this voice, you know, Nat calling out like, hey, like look over here. And you as the player will like shift usually and like look up, see Nat calling to Sarah, and then see another group of characters gathered up around the dining table. And then that gives you a lot of information about, oh, okay, so there's another part of the scene happening. While I've been paying attention to Sarah, maybe I should rewind and go see what Nat was talking to those people about. So that's sort of a nice moment where the hub is really a space where you can kind of like see multiple nodes of conversation happening and be made aware to go check out another part of the scene later, um, which is kind of nice. Do you guys want to hear a dorky level design thing about that? It's a scripting thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. So like you, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be able to hear everybody from everywhere. Like a hard, uh, something that I think most developers don't really, well, anyway, in this kind of game, it's not very common for you to have to really worry about like a lot of overlapping conversation, but we did. So it was like, how do we make it so you can hear people a little bit from far away, but it's not just stepping on each other. Um, some of that is our programmer, Hannah, put in a system where if you're looking at a character, they're louder, um, which is nice. If you look away from somebody, they get quieter. Um, but that doesn't really speak to something like someone literally calling all the way across the space. Um, so you could do something smart and programmery to do that, or you could do like we did, which is, when she yells, we script her voice range to be twice as far, yeah. and, and then we put it back to its normal range when she's yeah. done. Yeah, uh, we do that in a bunch of spots. Yeah. With the like, yeah, the far away conversations where people are like, "Hey." Yeah. So don't overthink it. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Just turn it up. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So this this worked out really well. Um, and also, if you think about it, like it would have felt sort of, I think, I think it would have been less rewarding given, given our mechanics if we had, for example, had this playroom where Sarah is separated by a hall and a door from the dining room, because then Nat would have had to walk down the hall to get Sarah, and the player wouldn't be able to see the crowd at the dinner table, right? So this sort of hub structure where the spaces are interconnected and looking into each other gives us the opportunity to make these moments where you can see things in the distance like that. Um, which wouldn't work as well with too many like very separated rooms that don't look into each other. Um, so obviously not every AR scene is gonna have like conversations that are always sort of interconnected like this and flowing in and out of each other. Sometimes there's gonna be very private moments um, that we want you know, to sort of isolate or that the characters would wanna isolate themselves like uh, the screenshot I have up there is when Evie goes into her office which is a private space and she sort of like takes something out of a drawer and you can look in it, it's a photo of her sister and she has this sort of private moment. Um, so it's for these private moments where characters are being more introspective or having like a one-on-one -on -one conversation that it's useful to have the private spaces be separated like we did on purpose sort of for the utilitarian aspect. It also helps us sort of design scenes that can have private moments because we have specific parts of the level that are designed to sort of make that possible. Um, we, we dubbed in some of the sound of constructing these levels into the background of the talk yeah, for your pleasure. The, yeah, the dub. The construction dub, not subbed. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we found a lot of useful ways to design AR scenes that made good use of the hub and spoke structure. And there were, there were still, oh, wait, why did I? I love it. I love PowerPoints. Uh, so, like I was saying, we found these useful ways to design levels that supported AR scenes that could have both interconnected moments where characters are talking to each other in groups and flowing in and out of conversations, and also the private stuff that happens in these more private spaces. We had found all these ways to design the levels to support that stuff, which was great. But we still had some elements of the level design that had to adapt to our AR scene specifically. So Tacoma is a station where people live. So for example, there's a lot of tables and chairs and beds and various objects that the characters would naturally have to interact with while they're going about their daily lives. Um, like 
wouldn't it be weird if like no one ever sat in a chair? Like that's just something like people do. So you would expect it to see in these like daily life scenes, right? Um, so we're a pretty small studio with one, one, one full-time animator who animated like almost all of it with some help later on, which was awesome. But uh, she did a great job and, but it meant that once the AR scenes were animated, there couldn't be significant changes to like what the animations were because she was making a lot of animations and had to keep going so we could, you know, ship the game. Uh, so we want to stay on schedule and if a character sits on a rock like Clive does in the screenshot, um, that rock can't move. The level designer put it there at one point, Noelle animated everything specifically to line up with it. If we move it, like, she's not going to update the animation. <laughs> That's on us. Um, so we had a lot of animation dependencies like that that were in communication with the level design and that we as level designers had to work around and be aware of. So here's an editor screenshot. Um, if I was placing or moving objects or architecture, I'd know that they were labeled as animation props, animation dependent props, um, so I would know not to move them. Um, and sometimes, like, sometimes you would also just like watch a scene to make sure like you weren't placing something in like an awkward position that a, a character was already moving through. Like if I wanted to do some set decoration, I would have to make sure like, don't put this like pile of garbage right where Evie's like walking, because why would she walk through that? She would trip over it. Um, so we had to be very careful about stuff like that. Because um, these AR scenes were being animated sort of simultaneously as we were like building these levels and placing a lot of stuff. So it was all happening in parallel, which was a lot. <laughs> it was intense. Uh, so sometimes we actually took advantage of this effect. Like I was talking about not wanting to place the garbage where Evie would clip through it while she's walking through it, because that would be weird. Sometimes we actually took advantage of that for narrative reasons, which was fun. Because seeing a character clip through something could give the player some information about the time when that AR scene, placed, that AR scene actually took place. Um, so basically, it could help the player understand the timeline of the narrative through observation of what objects were moved after the events in the AR scene occurred, or perhaps objects that had not moved since the AR scene had occurred. Um, so for example, in botany, uh, here we have Sarah's leg clipping through the hose, um, right at the bottom there where her foot is. Uh, and later on in the scene, you actually see Andrew setting up that very hose um, as part of the scene, he's sort of doing some maintenance to help the oxygen situation on the station. Um, so you can see him in this screenshot stepping over the same hose that she was formerly clipping through. Um, so while for the most part we tried to prevent air scene, air scene characters from clipping through stuff in ugly ways, uh, sometimes it was fun to provide this kind of narrative detail where you could have the situation, because if you think about it, every level is like always in cutscene mode, but a lot of the environment is like static, like this hose. So if you're watching it carefully, you can kind of catch these weird moments where it's like, oh yeah, this was moved during the scene and I can kind of see that. And what, what is the thing Andrew was actually touching? It's kind of fun to show the player like, this is an actual object that this character really did touch at some point. Um, so the environment really needs to be in conversation with these animations in both time and space based on this example I just gave. So while the level design of the floor plan was done before, like the, the paper maps and stuff was done before these animations existed, uh, we were still able to have our AR scenes be in narrative conversation with the environment using like set, set decoration moments like that that were placed sort of later after the paper mapping and gray blocking was done. So that was fun. Um, so I wanna go a little deeper into this time and space aspect of AR scenes being in conversation with the environment. Because um, one of our big challenges was guiding players to these things called AR desktops, which I have circled up there. Um, AR desktops are the characters' computer desktops uh, that they'll open from time to time at specific points in an AR scene. And when I say desktop, I mean like literally like their computer with their emails and stuff on it. Like you can throb, you can click whatever <laughs> that thing, the button in the air, and it opens their desktop in your vision. Um, so 
Given the spatial nature of AR scenes, this means an AR desktop is only accessible to a player during a specific window of time during an AR scene. Um, so for example, Nat only opens that desktop for like 30 seconds a minute into the scene, and then she'll close it after it being open for a couple seconds. Because um, that's like the amount of time she takes in the scene to check her email or whatever she's doing. Um, so, Early in development, we found that players were frequently missing out on these AR desktops entirely during playtests. Like they would just like miss them, not see them, maybe be near it in a scene, but be facing the wrong way, for example, and just like totally whiff on it. Um, and then would move on and just have no idea that there was like all this extra story stuff for them to discover, which is a problem for us. Um, so AR desktops often contain some like really great narrative beats. So we wanted to fix this issue. We had to learn how to guide the player to an AR desktop at a specific time in a specific part of the level, because um, otherwise they would just miss all the stuff. Uh, so here is an image of one of the early AR desktop button iterations in our editor. Um, and because the first approach we took to this was just like by relying on the button's visuals. And we were like, maybe if we make it eye catching enough, like people will just see it <laughs> easier, which is like kind of funny. That that was our first approach now that I think about it. Because it didn't work, because the whole problem was like sometimes people would just be in a different part of the area or like not looking at it at all. So no matter how eye-catching it was, they still weren't gonna see it because they needed to be in a specific place at a specific time. It wasn't an issue with the button being not obvious. It was an issue with place and time. Um, so we realized this, and it was a key realization because we looked at the AR desktop timeline, which I have like, this is actually our first sketch of this idea, which is funny, from our whiteboard. And that playing bar is like a rough sketch of our AR scene timeline that appears at the bottom of the screen that you're using to fast forward and rewind. Um, and we realized that has a lot, had a lot of free space on it that wasn't being used to convey any information. Um, and we were like, oh wait, we could give the player like some kind of hint on the timeline as to when the desktops are appearing. Um, so we are gonna switch to the next slide. <laughs> Here I've circled the AR desktop again. Um, and I've circled this time the pips, which are what sort of came from that realization that the AR scene timeline could be used to convey this information. Um, so we tutorialized this early on and stuff, but it actually worked out really naturally. Most players pick up on it right away, where it's like when you're scrubbing through the timeline, those little bubbles will like inflate and turn to their associated character's color when the desktop is active in the world, and then they'll like deflate when the desktop is closed. Um, so players can kind of use that to be like, okay, how long is it open for? What character should I be looking for? We didn't just rely on color, we have the character's um, job icon on each one also to like double up on that information. Um, and so yeah, that, that was a really great solution to be like, here's a way to give the player a hint, but not actually like give them like an in-world like quest marker or whatever, where they're like looking for it in the level. Like they just have the information of the timing and then they do the exploration themselves to find it. Um, so that worked really well. Uh, another challenge we faced um, early on in Tacoma's development that's related to the AR scenes uh, is that we wanted AR scenes and desktops to be tied to progression in some way, but we didn't know what that would be at first. Um, so we wanted to do, we tried some like traditional, ah, no, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We wanted to do some traditional progression at first involving keys and locks, because that's kind of what we were used to. So we tried that first, and then through play tests, we quickly learned that people would find keys in desktops. We put, the, we put them in a lot of desktops early on. And once players learned about that, their whole goal was just to look for desktops. And they would just fast forward through the whole scene, not listen to anything, <laughs> and just look for desktops, because they were like, the keys are all here. If I just find all the keys, I can progress through the video game, and that makes me feel good. And we were like, that's great but we want you to pay attention to our AR scenes, so we have to change how we think about progression to help the player actually like, want to engage with the AR scenes in the story while also feeling like they're making forward progress by doing that. Um, so basically, 
I pitched this thing called the sync device, which is, this is what it actually looks like in the game. And I was like, so these AR scenes narratively are this data that's been left over on the station, like these, this kind of like security camera-esque footage of what these people were doing there. And we also have this concept of like going to retrieve this AI, which would probably involve some sort of download. So I was like, what if in each wing of the station, you basically have like a USB drive type thing that you're plugging into that wing and like syncing with the data there as part of your mission to retrieve the AI. Like you have to sync with each wing in order to access the AI in the end. Um, and this I pitched as sort of like a, a progression system based on something that we understand from our real lives. So like people playing video games are probably familiar with downloading stuff or using a USB drive. So they know when they see this plug into the wall and it starts ticking away with its little percentage meter, players actually, we didn't, we thought this wasn't gonna work, but then it did. Players mostly are like, yeah, I see that download going. I'm gonna go do other stuff because downloads are slow. <laughs> and we make it go slow on purpose and don't give the player a clear understanding of what exactly is like making it tick. And they just assume it's gonna go and they can come back later and it'll all be fine. And this actually works. And we were really surprised and happy about that because this sort of gave players the room and time to move through space and counter the story while they're sort of like, okay, that download's going, so like, I guess I'll just chill and learn what's going on with these characters. Um, so the sync device in Tacoma creates this illusion for the player um, that the data is, is being synced. Um, and we don't have the sync device actually, like if you stand in front of it and look at it, it looks like it's ticking away steadily, but it's actually under the hood not. Um, so the device's completion percentage, which goes from zero to 100, um, is boosted every time you recover or completely finish an AR scene, whenever you walk into a new room. Um, and there are a couple of other smaller factors that like make this, the percentage go up a certain amount. Um, but we don't, there's nothing pinging the player about this. This is just happening purely under the hood. Um, so the boost based on player actions help, helps those who explore it because they're exploring and then they come back and they're like, oh, it's at 50% now. That's cool. I guess I'll go check out this other area and it'll probably be done by the time I'm back because that seemed to go pretty fast. Yeah. Um, it, it was also really important to us for the sync device to be located in a physical space that was outside of the wing. Um, we talked about having like a tracker. So like the characters in the story, Amy, who you're playing as, also has her own AR desktop that you can pull up at any time and you get messages on it and stuff. Um, and we talked about having like a tracker that you could check on your desktop and we did not do that because we knew that at that point, like it's, inter it's interesting to make a progression system that is explicitly about being opaque and and not knowable to the player. Um, and so if you could be like, oh, it's at 10%, and then I recovered this scene, and now it's at 20%, oh, I see, so I should just go game this and mm -hmm. find all the stuff to, then, again, you would it would be like when people were just going into desktops to try to find key codes. You would say, oh, okay, so, so now how do I touch everything to get this filled up as fast as possible? Whereas when you actually have to, like, walk down a hall to a space and start exploring it and then disengage from that to go back and check on what the progress is, it both makes it less clear you know, how to game it at all and it puts it out of your head until you're like, well, I think I'm done here. Maybe I should go check that thing. And, and then it gives you something to, to do to progress of your own volition without there being like achievement unlocked, achievement unlocked, just like popping up on your desktop as you play. Right. And our sync device isn't very strict about this stuff, so for most players, just by like going to each area, like it'll just go to under 100% without too much effort. So we wanted to make it sort of also easy to do right. while still requiring some amount of like exploration and yeah. engagement with um, AR scenes. Um, so yeah, it, it was sort of designed to support these non-linear levels because the sync device doesn't really care what order you're encountering things in. It just says, engage with the environment, I'll take care of the rest. So that worked out really well for us. Um, there's sync device again. And now we have some hilarious, horrible art from me that I drew of it when I was pitching it. Uh, so there's some fun stuff to show you sort of where we started with this. 
we wanted to like, we like did think about how, how would Amy carry this around? That was kind of fun. And then Kate, uh, our environment artist, drew lovely concept art of it, which is great. Um, so that's kind of what our initial design was uh, for it. So yeah, that's sort of my end of things. And I'm gonna pass it back to Steve and he's gonna talk more about stuff. <laughs> Thanks. So you're doing a pair talk is great. You get so much more applause. Wow. Um, so, you know, I think what Nino was talking about is, um, you know, from our perspective, all of the elements of what we were doing um, were really in conversation with each other. Um, you know, the spaces are connected to the fictional function of the station. The AR scenes are connected to the shape of the spaces. The player's HUD markers and the design of the progression mechanic are connected to how the player engages with the AR scenes um, and how they direct themselves through each area. And all these elements support each other and they loop back into each other, right? Like the, 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 the space determines the progression, and the progression tells you something about the setting and the fiction and what your job is, and that, anyway. So, you know, they, this is, none of them stand on their own, and they're all reinforcing each other. Um, so from a creative direction and player experience standpoint, uh, that's really good. Uh, you know, we're talking about unifying all of these disparate elements and making them feel like they are a cohesive whole. Um, and you know, this level of deep integration between all the parts of the story and the environment and the mechanics, um, it also presents a lot of its own production challenges. Um, so let's talk about the writing and recording and the implementation of an AR scene. Um, something that was uh, interesting, I think unique, about how we, how we worked is um, we had to have our gray block layouts of the station locked down before I could write the story. Um, because the playable spaces in the station um, determined what would happen in each scene. The, the scenes are about these characters moving through these spaces, so I needed to know the kitchen's over here and the conference room is over here and the dining table is here and the pool table is there before I even wrote a scene about how Nat was gonna call down to Sarah at the pool table at this point in the story. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And I don't think that there are a lot of games where the level layout being locked is a dependency on starting to write the story <laughs> of the game. Um, but that meant that we had to iterate early and feel confident in, okay, like these spaces make sense for the function of the space and for like a, an explorable space fictionally and you know, at, from the, the player's perspective and feel confident in that because you know, like, like Nina was saying about the animations, having a dependency on just a prop being placed somewhere, the story had a dependency on the level design not changing very much. Um, so up on screen um, is the, the, uh, the, the paper map that Nina showed earlier, the kind of final paper map of this section of the admin wing, and then next to that uh, is a couple of pages from my notebook writing the game. Um, I, I always write all my stuff um, longhand in notebooks, um, and it can be really useful to, you know, see revisions and see how things are connected. You can see a little bit of highlighter um, here. The, writing this game was, um, th there's a lot of stuff uh, that we did on this game that we really didn't have anything, any examples to look at for the most part, so we just kind of had to figure it out. So in Tacoma, there, you know, the, the game is about there being these sections of scenes that branch off and happen in parallel and then come back together. So there were parts where I would be writing a scene and then highlight like the blue part is this sub scene and the green part is this sub scene. They're happening at the same time and then they come back together. Um, so the level design and, and the writing were really of a piece. Um, and you know, at that point, yeah, we kind of had to just like stick with it. We had to, we had to go from there. Five minutes? Well, I'll be goddamned. All right. Um, uh, so because, as noted, we had to lay out the space, write the stuff, and then we had to go record it. And we recorded um, Tacoma ensemble style. There's Mike Surix. I see him right there, our voice director. Um, Mike Surix is, is here. Um, we felt it was really important because all of these scenes were about 
um, characters being in a room together and having discussions and being face to face and having these intense moments for us to record the game on a sound stage with all the actors present performing the scenes together, um, which was which was fantastic. The the actors um, were really excited about it because in games mostly it's you know one person in a booth and another person in a booth and them being able to perform this basically like as a stage play um, was was so, you know them being able to like react to each other's energy in in the scene and everything was really exciting. Um, but it also meant that we laid out the levels, wrote the story, flew down to LA, got six actors together for two days and recorded the entire game. And we weren't gonna do that twice, so that had to stick as well. So we had, like, uh, for people who have shipped larger games, um, voice recording on Tacoma was locked 14 months before we shipped. Um, because our animator, Noel, had to animate the fucking game based on those reads so like if, if we we could have done pickups you know like small pickups but we couldn't be like you know what this scene should we should do this should be something different here because then you know Noel had to wait until we had the final recordings to even really start you know she could block out these scenes but to actually animate them again another dependency on um, this whole stack of, of everything being related to each other which is you know part of what Nina pointed out but uh, something that we were really happy to be able to have is that um, because, like Nina was saying, that we're basically in cutscene mode all the time, it meant, it meant that the, the animations could be very conversant with the environments. So we did a lot of the characters touching the world. So in all of these you know, screenshots, you can see Andrew's leaning on a rail and Evie runs her hand along this railing as she goes up the ramp and Nat is sitting on the edge of a thing. And you know that's at that point another place where the gray block influenced the story, and then the story influenced the animations, and then the animations were touching a railing. So if that railing was, for instance, gray blocked in when the animation was made, and then we put the mesh in, the mesh had to match the gray block down to like the centimeter, or else the hand would now be floating or clipping or blah blah blah. Um, and you know that that went all the way down to things like placing this mug. So at some point we were like, we're gonna have a jazz mug in the game because we had a jazz mug in, in Gone Home and that's important to us. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Noel, our animator was like, oh, okay, so this mug is here. So how about uh, Clive is like carrying this mug and drinking from it during the first part of the scene and he puts it there during the scene. And so we were like, cool, that makes sense. And then at some point we were play testing, we noticed that Clive puts the mug, like he, he like, puts the mug down and his hand just goes through it. And it's like, there's no way for us to move the object in such a way that he wouldn't just go, just do that. Just knock that mug over. Um, and so, it, so that was one of those points where it's like, we do need to update, update that animation because it's no way that it makes sense for this mug to be here otherwise. But so, you know, like, uh, um, so, um, you know, it, it's something like this where it, it gets the screenshots a little dark, but we had a bunch of angled walls in the game and, you know, those were gray blocked in and, and then it was animated for Evie to be leaning on this wall, but when the wall mesh came in, if the angle was a few de ang degrees different. So those, those are these, like, little things where we intended to build an experience where everything was talking to everything else, but that meant that everything was talking to everything else. The geo talked to the writing, talked to the recording, talked to the animation, which then once the animation was in, it talked back to the geo because the geo had to like, you know, re make sure that it was consistent with the animation once it existed. Um, so when you're starting out, you should try to fully consider all of the dependencies that are involved in creating a unified design as early as you can. Not because you shouldn't do it, but because you should know what you're signing up for. And as, as I noticed, I mean, as I noted, we didn't have a lot of precedence for what we were doing, so we discovered a lot of this along the way. But I think there is valuable space for people to work in that I think is easy not to do, which is the mental projection of, if I do this, what are the five steps later and what's this gonna touch? Um, it's easy to be like, if we do this, it'll be cool. Or if we do this, it'll touch this one thing. Um, but really kind of trying to do the visualization exercise of like, what is this going to lead all the way to? Um, I think it'd be valuable even just so that you can expect those things before they happen instead of stumbling upon them when they do. Um, one minute? That's good, um, because I'm on my last idea. Um, so we're talking about doing a lot of stuff that hasn't been done before. We're talking about um, doing, um, you know, getting away from a traditional lock and key um, progression. Uh, but that said, 
we also did rely on those traditional hierarchy of information um, or hierarchy of value uh, approaches in supplemental information. So the central space is very interconnected. They're based on these AR scenes. But we also wanted to encourage and reward players to fully explore all of our spaces, including like the side spaces that Nina was talking about. And that totally goes back to stuff that we've done before. We have like keypad doors that lock off optional areas, and it encourages the player to say, how am I going to find this keypad? And then when you get in there, we have to reward the player. And in, in a more traditional game, that might be like some rare ammo or upgrade points or something. In our case, it was just extra information that tells you more about the story because you did the work to find it, but it isn't central to the player's experience, but that uses a very traditional approach to hiding keys, making blocks be clear, rewarding you for doing the traditional level stuff um, to, get, to get in there. Um, but we have to think of it in terms of, again, the writing goes back to like what part of the story are we going to put in here that it's okay for the player to miss, but that they'll actually be excited about finding. Um, so, you know, for whatever you're working on, stuff that is traditional, I think, is worth like relying on as appropriate, um, even if it's not like the new, fresh, exciting thing. Thank you very much, Renina, Steve. Tacoma is going to be in the IGF pavilion if you want to play it. <laughs> <laughs>